In today's episode, we're gonna start things off by going over the Starship SN2 tank test that happened earlier this week and the progress that is SN3. Then we'll highlight some key points that Elon made at this year's Satellite 2020 conference. We'll debrief the recent CRS-20 launch, talk about the near future for SpaceX, and finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Special K, and this is SpaceX in the News. As I was releasing our previous episode of SpaceX in the news last Friday, SpaceX was gearing up to test SN2's thrust puck weld. It was the issue that caused SN1 to launch before its time, and thus gave SpaceX the reason to take SN2 apart for testing of that specific part again. So on Friday night, they filled the silly stunted SN2 tank with H2O, and therefore for a couple of hours, it was technically a water tower, as prophesized in 2018. But the test was successful, and some aliens even performed a celebratory air show. Then on Sunday, locals John Randolph and Maria Pointer snapped some pics of SpaceX mounting a catch to the bottom of the puck that would later connect to a hydraulic arm during the evening's cryo test as a way to simulate Raptor thrust and creating even more stress on the system. The cryo test lasted a good eight hours while SpaceX slowly filled the vessel with liquid nitrogen, topping it off, venting, filling it up again, venting again, ramming it from the bottom late into the night. Straight up abuse, yo. And it seems as though the test was going so well that the engineers were deliberately trying to bust the seams open. But I think it's safe to say that the tank held at least 7 to 8.5 bar. Elon tweeted the next day that the vessel passed the cryo pressure and engine thrust load tests, and that SN3 is now on deck. She will be the starship to perform a static fire and shorter flights. SN4 will do the longer ones. But again, his big motivation is to spool up the Starship and Raptor production line. And although they aren't quite there yet, lacking a perfect assembly line doesn't seem to be slowing them down. Already, the Boca team has many major pieces of SN3 built and stacked, including the nose, both propellant tanks, and the engine skirt. In fact, SpaceX may be going so fast that Cameron County seems to be having trouble keeping up. Local Channel 5 News and KRGV.com said that the county judge responsible for closing off both the local highway and beach during SpaceX's tests has some questions for the space company after SN1 unexpectedly exploded a couple weeks ago. The blast was felt miles away. We're going to ask for a little bit more specificity when they've got to test or they make a request for a closure. For all future SpaceX tests, the county says it will employ the county fire marshal or the emergency management director. On Monday afternoon, Elon Musk sat down for an interview at the Satellite 2020 convention, where he arrived late and disheveled because of his unrelenting dedication to building his Boca Chica Starship factory. And uh, um, yeah, actually, that was the real reason I was late, is because I was at Boca Chica. My apologies. Uh, I was just uh, working on Starship uh, with being there. So it's pretty cool out there, actually. I like it. He immediately started off by stating that his fear is humanity getting stuck in a local maximum and that society may not be innovating fast enough. Well, the thing, that, the thing that concerns me most right now is that unless we improve our rate of innovation dramatically, then there is no chance of a base on the moon or a city on Mars. You know, the, the space shuttle was something that was really stuck in a local maximum for a long time. Mm -hmm. Dragon really is just a low with orbit transport vehicle. It, it really would not make sense to have a Block 6 Falcon 9 you know, from where we are right now. So we need a fairly big, but definitely rapidly and completely reusable rocket. This is the fundamental thing. Without that, we're going nowhere. Elon also revealed that the reason they moved from a carbon fiber composite material for Starship to stainless steel was a complete accident. It actually happened because we were moving too slowly on composite. Um, and I was like, we cannot move this slowly or we'll go bankrupt. So <laughs> just get, do this with steel. But it was a good thing they did because steel is easier to work with, cheaper and more resilient. And he restated what he believes is the hardest part about Starship development. The, the hard part is you now actually building that thing even once is hard. And then building a production line is a thousand percent harder, mm -hmm. uh, like at least a thousand percent harder. Elon also updated us on his future vision for Starship reusability. It's being designed for about in, uh, you know, to, to be relaunch, relaunched an hour after landing. The, the only thing you expect to change on a regular basis is propellant. But, but I think we, we want to aim for a capability of three flights a day for the ship. And when asked about mining the moon, Elon said he has no aspirations to do so. 
and even using the moon to get to Mars isn't necessary. To visit, sure, but you know, it's not like a mandatory stop. You know? But as far as Starlink is concerned, he does have aspirations to make his satellites a lean, mean, connected machine. And we're targeting latency below 20 milliseconds. Uh, so somebody could, could, could play a, a fast response video game uh, at a competitive level. And also giving specifics about what Starlink customers can expect when installing their home terminals. The, at least the version one of the user terminal will actually have actuators on it so that it can, it, it can um, improve the pointing accuracy. The, the, the instructions in the box will, they're just two instructions and they can be done in either order. Uh, point at sky, plug in. Elon's confident about Starlink's reflectivity issues that is keeping many astronomers and stargazers up at night. I am confident that we will not cause any impact whatsoever in astronomical discoveries. No. We'll take corrective action if it's above zero. Uh, but now, now that the satellites are on orbit, uh, I'll be impressed if, if somebody can actually tell me where, where all of them are. We are actually working with senior members of the science community and, and senior astronomers to minimize the potential for reflection mm -hmm. uh, of the satellites. One of his best responses of the interview came after he was asked about Gwen Shotwell's comments that she made a couple months ago concerning the possibility of taking Starlink public in the future. We're thinking about that zero. Was that, we're thinking about that what? Zero. Zero? Zero. Not thinking about it at all. We need to make the thing work. Yeah, we just want to be in the not bankrupt category. That's our goal. Now that doesn't mean SpaceX has changed its mind about taking Starship public. It just means it's the least of their worries right now, considering how many satellite companies have gone out of business trying to enter the Constellation market. And speaking of which, at the Satellite 2020 conference, SpaceX Vice President of Starlink and Sales revealed that the company's Starlink production rate is up four times faster than the competitor, OneWeb. And Chief Operations Officer Gwen Shotwell confirmed SpaceX is still, quote, looking at a May timeframe to launch crew for the first time, which is a reference, of course, to Dragon and Demo 2. This came after talk of the potential effect of coronavirus across the space industry. Most industry leaders sounded optimistic, but Satellite 2020 was canceled early, however, due to coronavirus fears. One NASA employee has tested positive at this time. And since we're on the subject, guys, let me just say, don't live your lives in fear because of the media. Just be smart about how you handle yourself and weather the storm. Now, the virus isn't technically alive, but eventually it will die. How can you die when you're dead? Hashtag zombie apocalypse. All right, let's debrief SpaceX's last launch, CRS-20. On Friday night, the Falcon 9 booster lifted off from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral to bring new experiments to the International Space Station. The plume from the first stage engines gave off some psychedelic colors before fighting against the elements to land successfully at LZ-1. Elon tweeted that the reason the last Starlink booster missed the drone ship was because of incorrect wind data, and that they were going to use the high winds during this recent landing to push the envelope of what the booster is capable of. And because this booster landed successfully, the envelope was expanded. But after a successful separation from the second stage, Dragon deployed its solar arrays and made its way to the ISS, where it berthed a few days later. And it's still up there, but it will be returning back to Earth for its final splashdown with more than 4,000 pounds of cargo in a few weeks. This is the final mission for the current version of Cargo Dragon. From now on, it's expected that a modified version of a Crew Dragon capsule will make these supply runs. Doing so allows them to autonomously dock with the station instead of berth with a mechanical arm. In other news, the Falcon 9 booster that flew two missions for NASA that I mentioned in last week's episode is now officially on display for public viewing at Space Center Houston. The ribbon to the outdoor exhibit ceremony was cut at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Thursday this week. So if you want to see it, you can book your tickets now, or maybe wait a few weeks. The next SpaceX launch is expected to happen tomorrow at 9.42 in the morning Eastern Time. Although it does look like now SpaceX may be targeting 9.22 in the morning on Sunday. And it's for another batch of 60 Starlink sats. The Falcon 9 rocket, with payload already sitting on top, is currently vertical at the pad at the Cape. It's scheduled to do a static fire test sometime today. Once the payload is in orbit, this will bring the tally up to around 350 operational satellites for the Constellation. And it will also be a record-setting fifth launch of a Falcon booster, which will once again make a drone ship landing on Of Course I Still Love You. And the fairing is also expected to be recovered as well. Of course, I'll be covering it right here on my channel, so if you're lonely, join me. And now, it's time for today's honorable mention.
All right, today I wanna to spend this segment revisiting the most recent updates for Kerbal Space Program 2. Something I haven't done since the game was announced in August. So if you're a new guy or gal to the space nerd community and have no idea what KSP even is, let me tell you. It's a rocket simulation game, kind of like Flight Simulator, only you don't just fly rockets, you build them as well. And a bunch of other things too, like space stations, rovers, planes, satellites, ships, and even dragons. Yeah, someone has actually built a dragon in the game, and I don't mean a SpaceX dragon. And the game also uses pretty realistic physics, so venturing out into the Kerbal system takes a lot of trial and error. Well, that first game came out in 2011, but now KSB2 is in development and has been for a couple years. So let's talk about the latest news of the coming game. Well, it's now being developed by Private Division. Since the KSP2 announcement trailer, they opened up a new development studio that's solely focused on building the game. And now they're working even closer with Squad, who are the makers of KSP1. The devs have done countless interviews you can find online, and late last month released two more videos on their YouTube page that concerns the game's progress. The first gives a studio update, which basically just explains what I just told you, and the second is the beginning of a new series of development episodes that will be released over the coming months. This first one focuses on next generation tech, explaining how the developers research with professionals in the rocket science community to speculate what the future may hold for space exploration. They used real scientific papers that have been done for future propulsive engineering and in detail implemented it into the game. But we also know that you can color all the different parts of your vehicles and have a variety of colors to choose from. And that multiplayer is coming along nicely. The devs have been having a blast playing it themselves in the studio. The tutorial is being completely overhauled with video animations to help new players learn how to navigate the game. The heads up display has been streamlined. There's a new blueprint mode to help you construct your vehicles more easily. Launch towers are like the strong back. They move slightly after launch so your rocket doesn't collide with it. Ice effects falling off rockets upon launches in the game. There will be a countdown you can choose to use, which I will. There will be more solar systems to travel through with planets, again realistically designed but also designed to bring new challenges to solve as far as landing on them goes. And they look very real. Apparently the graphics are sehr gut. And there's not just artificial gravity you can use in the game now, there will be a reason to use it. Maybe for the health of your Kerbals, I don't know, we'll see. You can build colonies basically anywhere you want on any planet, and pretty much must do so if you want to explore deeper into the Kerbalverse. Using time zoom will slow down colony expansion, and Kerbals are more animated and react to different situations you place them in. They actually shift around in their seats when exposed to G-forces, and they also are a little bit more unique with different outfits, faces, and hair, which you can change. Oh, and they also like to dance. But most importantly to me is that there will be clouds, which will make for a cloud looking good time. The game was originally scheduled to release around this time actually, but with the merger happening, it's now expected to release sometime between, you know, April and March. A Little bit of a spread. Doesn't matter though, so as long as it's good, this game, like its predecessor, has the potential to provide decades of entertainment. Private Division will be releasing more development episodes over the coming months, so keep an eye on their channel. You can also continue to keep up on the latest KSP2 news on my website in the blog page. You'll find more information there than what I gave you in this video. If you have any suggestions for future honorable mentions, something space related in the news that you like and want me to cover, send me a tweet. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. A shout out to all my eccentric members and patrons who continue to show their love for this channel. If you're interested in doing the same, you can check out the link in the description below. But there are more ways you can financially support the creation of these videos. You can subscribe and hit that like button. It's free. But you can also buy one of our fresh new shirts, the Disruptor, available now. Use coupon code PADDY, that's P-A-D-D-Y, for 10% off this weekend. And for a limited time only, our best-selling design, Jolly Rocket, is now available in different colors. And it's even got that authentic weathered look to it now. It's what I call properly pirated. Again, a big thank you goes to artist Sean Jenner for lending me his hands. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and I'll see ye back here bright and early for tomorrow's Starlink launch. Until that time, Godspeed.